Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to this evening's event. I'm thrilled to be talking tonight with two such wonderful writers, the brilliant Edmund White, who I met over 15 years ago, I believe, in my very first days at the Center for Fiction, or the Mercantile Library, as it was then known. And his work has meant so much to me. And, and to Yi Yun Lee, whose work I first discovered through stories she published in The New Yorker and The Zo and Zoetra years ago, and whose work I've been following very um, ever since and um, have found very affecting and very moving um, on many levels. And um, so we'll be talking tonight about their two recent um, novels just out. I was in a bookstore this afternoon and saw both novels, A Saint from Texas um, by Edmund White and Must I Go by Yi Young Lee, very, um, very prominently displayed. I'm going to hold them up because they're so beautiful. The covers there, if you can see them. And there's this cover. I suppose everything is backwards, but I can't help that. Um, let me tell you a little bit about um, both authors, for those of you who don't um, um, know their histories. Yi Young Lee is the author of seven books, including Where Reasons End, the winner of the Penn Jean Stein Award, and this novel, um, Must I Go, is published now in July. She's the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Wyndham Campbell Award, among many other honors, and she teaches at Princeton University. Edmund White is the author of many novels, including A Boy's Own Story, The Beautiful Room is Empty, The Farewell Symphony, and Our Young Man. His nonfiction includes City Boy, Inside a Pearl, The Unpunished Vice, and other memoirs, The Flaneur about Paris, one of my favorite books about Paris, and literary biographies and essays. He was named the 2018 winner of the Penn Saul Bellow Award for Achievement in American Fiction and received the National Book Foundation's 2019 Medal for Distinguished Contributions to American Letters. He lives in New York. Um, and um, I, one thing I want to say about both of them is that they are both novelists and memoirists, and I think that that is something we'll be talking about later um, as we talk about the scope of um, both of these novels, which engage the whole lifetimes of their characters. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the books. Uh, Yi Yun, um, Must I Go, um, is a story centered on an elderly woman who has outlived three husbands, raised five children, and seen the arrival of 17 grandchildren. Um, She's now turned her attention to a strange little book, not so little book actually, um, published by um, um, a Vanity Press, which is the diary of a man named Roland Bully, with whom she had a fleeting affair that resulted in uh, the birth of her child, Lucy, and then lost almost all contact with. Um, Edmonds, a saint from Texas, is bold and sweeping story that traces the extraordinary fate of twin sisters, one destined for Parisian nobility and the other for Catholic sainthood. It is a book that is about um, incest, infidelity, um, <laughs> incest, inf infidelity, um, inauthenticity, <laughs> um, Paris at its worst and its best, and is also um, deeply moving, but also hilariously funny. So um, in tonight's event, which is titled The Long View, um, um, we'll talk about how these books track their characters over their lifetimes. But first I wanted to ask both of you to tell um, me and to tell each other what you most loved about each other's novels, because I know that um, your friends and that you've passed these novels back and forth as you were writing them, I think. And so I'd love to have um, your sense of um, what readers should look for and what you loved about your friend's novel. Well, I, I loved in Yi Yun's book, the uh, multiple uh, perspectives and that sometimes would confirm each other and sometimes cancel each other out because you have many voices 
talking mm-hmm. about the same events and and I found that fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I want to read just one sentence from Ed's book. This is been, <laughs> <laughs> because this so represents this novel and a lot of Ed's book to me. Mm-hmm. I thought that to be successful in love requires a certain courage and acting as if one is sane, self-respecting, autonomous, and ability to fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, you know, not, not only it's about to be in love or to succeed in love, you have to be, you have to have courage. I think even just to live and to write, you have to have a lot of courage. And all Ed's books, you know, they are about so many things, but there's always that courage there for me. Oh, mm-hmm. thank you. That's nice Excellent. I mean, both of your books are very much about the complexities of love over a lifetime and also about um, how, how faking it is, it is an essential part of love. Um, that's true in your book as well, uh, Yiyun, I think. Um, the character of Lilia um, is so interesting in that she's at once a very cold person and once an extremely accepting and loving person. Um, and um, the same is, and in your book, Ed, the same from Texas, um, Yvonne, or Yvonne, what should we call her, <laughs> um, is, um, She's a go-getter, but she's really also deeply looking for love, as is her sister, and, and having a really hard time um, finding it in the ways that are meaningful. Um, so I wonder, what for both of you, was that the central impetus for both novels, or, or not so much, this, this idea of how love is sort of inexplicable and in how we how it unfolds over a lifetime well, or was it something uh, else entirely uh, I'm, a, a friend of mine said that uh the person to whom i dedicated this book uh said that he uh he thought the nun was the sensual one <laughs> and that the baroness is the kind of cold uh, intellectual one and uh, I mean, I think I wanted, well, the way the book evolved for me is that I, um, I started to write a book about a woman I actually knew who was a European baroness who had a tragic fate and her daughter committed suicide. And it was uh, bad news. And everybody got mad at me for wanting to write about them because they said, oh, how dare you? Uh, invade their lives. So then I thought, okay, I'll set the book in Texas, which is a long way away from Europe. And uh, then I thought, I am I think everybody's tired of my writing about society people. So maybe I'll write about a saint because I'm an atheist myself, but a kind of what I call mystical atheist, where I've always been preoccupied by religion. So I thought, it would be fun to write about a religious person. I can't even, well, I have to imagine what her life is like. And uh, so that's the way the book evolved, which sounds very strange. Oh, that's so interesting. And how about you, Yian? Well, yeah, I mean, the book started not with Lydia, the, the, the heroine, but it's it started with this man, Roland. And I, I just... I, I, I saw I, I, I always like to read people's letters and diaries and in one man's diary and this man I, I can't even remember who he is probably not a very famous person there was one line in his diary and said you know I have achieved nothing I don't even have like a legitimate, legitimate uh, child or if there is a child born I would not know that and I, you know, a novelist, when you see someone said, I don't know if there's a child, of course there's a child. So, so I started there just imagining the man and I started to keep a diary for him just to get who he is. And I kept a diary for about three months. 
-hmm. And it turned out after three months, the man became a secondary character and Lydia mm -hmm. gave me to know. Uh -huh. yes. It's very interesting how in, in both novels, um, Ed, you use the letters, the letters of Yvette to Yvonne are the way that we understand who she is primarily. Um, but we also have a sense um, from um, Yvonne's reactions to them that she's a, a bit of, as everyone is, an unreliable narrator in her letters. And the same is true of Roland in his um, diary, um, you know, and so the idea that the diary, the journal entries are very important in your book, Dion, and the, and the letter is so important in your book, Edmund, I just wondered how, what the process was around that and, and why you decided to, it's in a way, it, it becomes for the reader, for me as a reader, a little more intimate, and then at the same time, a little there's a little bit of removal where you step back and you read a read a letter, and you step a little out of the narrative, or you step a little out in a good way, in a, in a in a really good way, for in the journal entries. Um, so, can you talk about what inspired you to write the books in the, those particular ways? Well, uh, I mean, like you and I, I, I'm always fascinated by journals and letters. And I remember finding some very intimate letters from a total stranger on the street and reading them and thinking, oh, my God, this this is a novel right here. And, uh, you, you know, uh, you know, if you tell people that you're a writer, they'll start telling you their life story. And everybody assumes. <laughs> that that's boring, but it isn't. It can be really interesting. And uh, I've heard some marvelous stories <laughs> from cab drivers in Paris and uh, different places. People, oh, you're a writer, you should write my story. And then they tell you the story. And so uh, I thought letters were an interesting form. Mm -hmm. uh, and between sisters, it could be very intimate and they wouldn't have to go into lots of exposition because they already know the whole background. Yeah. yeah. Especially since they're identical twins. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's in every way except in no way. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> they're so incredibly different, which is part of the allure. And I agree um, with your friend who said that the more sensual of the two women is um, none. Um, so, yeah, which I found very, there's some very, that was a very hot trip, hot trip they took to Rome. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so, um, in a way, though, sex is, sex is not front and center in either book. I mean, uh, Edmund, in, in your novel, of course, there, you, you you write about sex better than anyone I can imagine, um, always. But but in this book, you you step back a little from that sometimes, and and so we feel like that's um, not as not really um, center well, stage. Yeah, center well, stage. I think I think partly it's uh, because uh, of who they are. They they can't really be pornographic. Yeah. I mean, one mm -hmm. of them is a baroness of a certain age, and the other one is a nun in South America. And I mean, they can't just uh, <laughs> d describe things in the, in the most lurid way. But but you, you do get the hint that they've had lots of uh, juicy experiences. Yeah, you do. You do. Well, that you also get that from about Roland, but but Roland um, seems to so intellectualize everything um, in a certain way, or stand apart from all these uh, affairs, one night stands, liaisons he has in in the book. And but it what you it, they felt necessary to his character, and I wonder why you 
do that. He could have just, there are two, for those of you watching, um, you're going to love both books when you read them. If you haven't read them, there are two primary women in Roland's life, Sidel and Hetty. Mm -hmm. And actually, Lydia is not a person who is terribly important to him, although she's the person who is the heroine of the story and telling the story. But then Roland has, I don't know, it felt like he was having a thousand other sexual experiences <laughs> as well. So so tell me a little bit about that, John, and why. You yes. So Roland, as you know, Roland, from the very beginning, from when he was a teenager, there, he had this ambition to write his diary for posterity. So he his entire diary for 70 years, well, 60, almost 70 years, they were really a record for people to admire him. So, mm -hmm. so all these lovers, all these women, as you said, you know, they came into his diaries and mostly just for him to appreciate himself, to enjoy <laughs> himself. I think, you know, you got all these <laughs> women coming in as mirrors of his ego and, mm -hmm. And of course, the you know, Sedell is not that mirror. So Sedell is an important, his wife Hetty is important. But Lydia is interesting to me because Lydia is a footnote in Roland's diary. You know, a mm -hmm. footnote in someone who's already, you know, so obscure, but so full of himself, so believed in his posterity. That footnote was more interesting to me. So, so that's, you know, I think, Roland never really wrote about all these sex encounters, but he... It's sort of the revenge of the footnote. Yeah, the footnote, <laughs> the footnote was telling the whole story about their encounter. And, exactly. Uh, yes. And, and what, what I loved about it is you get that... Um, the, the novel is structured so that you have his journal entries, then you have his later comments on the journal entries, and then you have um, Lilia's comments on the journal entries and and um, and additions to them and questions about them that which which are so fascinating to me. Um, his journal entry and his comments are are one level, and then she somehow, although a very down to earth person um takes it to another level takes us to you feel like she's trying to work out something very important about what it means to be alive by doing this it's not just a walk through uh, uh, a former lover's journals yeah and, and it gives you a, a kind of peripheral vision uh, perspective on many different lives yeah yeah, yeah. One thing that I noticed, uh, um, because I've read so much of, of your books, both of your books, and I know you both as memoirists, is that term? And um, so I'm interested not so much in what facts from your own biographies have come into these novels, but I'm really interested in that process, in that process where I see in a uh, saint from Texas certain things that are in your, what we know about you, Edmund, and the same thing um, for you, Yian Li, from um, your nonfiction. Um, and they're then present in these novels. And I wonder if that is, you know, is there a novel written where some fact, I mean, this is all novels have something of the author's lives in them. That's not unusual. But um, because of your, you're both brilliant, really, at memoir, too. I wondered how that, what those decisions were like, what that process was like of revisiting some things that were in your memoirs or in your life in these novels, did they just seep in? Was it deliberate? Was it another way of telling those stories, working on those things, revisiting after, you know, some, in your case, Edmund, many years? Um, so- can, I, I can think you... well, what, one thing that people forget is how fast writers work. 
and so they're uh, always grabbing for nearby things. You know, like if uh, if you like w when I have my nun staying with her girlfriend in Rome, I put them in a, a, a place that uh, resembles the uh, the French ac Academy in Rome, wh where I've stayed, and where I uh, and. They have a big storm in the middle of the night, the way it occurred when I was there. But I mean, in other words, you grab autobiographical details because you need some details and mm -hmm. and you can't just think them all up. Mm -hmm. And or, or at least I think readers can tell when the details are based on reality and they prefer those mm -hmm. than ones that are totally imagined. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Uh, but it, anyway, I think writers try to give a, a, a real effect to every detail they use. Like I used to have my writing students uh, read uh, Stanislavski's uh, An Actor Prepares. And, you know, he's the one who invented the method of acting. And, uh, and his idea was that, let's say you were a 19-year-old girl uh, and and your job was to be Lady Macbeth, and you'd never murdered anybody, but uh, maybe you'd been mean to your cat once or something. So uh, uh, you you're supposed to dig from that private memory and match it with the part that you're playing. And I think that's something that writers do oftentimes is try to dig into their own experience to find a, an equivalent, even if it's an absurd one. Mm -hmm. to to the action yes and I, yes I agree. and i i agree the the peripheral the, the peripheral, the peripheral facts, or facts or details we can you hear me i hear myself you can hear me i can yeah, hear I, I, you okay so i i think partly i agree with uh ed we take things from certainly our own lives but there's a difference, there's a key difference for me between memoir or nonfiction and fiction is, you know, when you write a character, the character is always flawed, the character is always, you know, the character is full of follies, and but you still love the character and you, you argue with the character, you struggle with the character. And I mean, my characters are oftentimes not likable. I, I'm told I don't write likable characters, but I still like them because they're not likable. But if I'm writing a memoir about myself, I think my ego will hurt if I don't like myself. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I think I would rather not write about myself in my memoir, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your contract with the reader is completely different in the two genres. Because in a memoir, you're, you're obliged to tell the truth, all the truth and nothing but the truth, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas in a novel, you can make stuff up and uh, you can rearrange it. Like for instance, people, I wrote a novel called A Boy's Own Story and people said, well, why did you call that a novel instead of a memoir? And I said, well, when I wrote it in 1983, Nobody's didn't write memoirs. I mean, you had to be the winner of the Battle of Iwo Jima or the inventor of the tennis ball to, to write a, a memoir. And, uh, and, and so that's one reason why I made it a novel. But also it's very convenient when it's a novel. You can rearrange the chronology. You can simplify things. If he had 10 lovers, he can have two in the book. and. Uh, you know, everything can be neater. And um, wh whereas in, an, in a memoir, you're obliged to put in all the things about yourself and you have to portray your negative sides, as, <laughs> which isn't so much fun. It's not. And, and also I agree. The other thing is like when you're writing, like at least in my experience, if I'm writing a memoir, I'm also arguing with myself and I would rather mm -hmm. like to argue with a character than with myself. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> mm. And also, I mean, uh, I, I want to disagree with you about the unsympathetic character thing, though, Yi Yun, uh, because I absolutely love Lumia. 
I, by maybe it's just where I am in my life or whatever, but I just found her so engaging uh, as the character. One of the great characters in the books I've read over the last five years. Just, uh, I really recommend um, it for that alone, um, that that character is so unique and worth connecting to. Yeah. She's very unpredictable because yeah. like, just when you think she's going to be very salty, then suddenly she's sweet and, uh, and she's very variable. Yeah, and those scenes when she's with Roland in the hotel, and when she those short conversations she has with Roland, uh, she's so smart. She's so sassy. She's so full of life, and and so for a young girl, how old is she? Sixteen in those, 16, you know. Yeah. You just feel this this aliveness in her, and this you know that this is going to you feel this will evolve into a woman who knows who she is because she's 16 and she already knows who she is. So that's that's really um, what makes her so interesting. I think there's sometimes a tendency for, our, um, for characters of that age to be sort of lost or seeking or in transition or not fully human in a certain way in books that you read, not fully alive. And so I really appreciated that even at 16, she was there, so there on the page. Yeah. Well, Ed's, was, Ed's, Ed's twin sisters at 16 were quite something to oh my <laughs> They were amazing. And I think, I think that, well, you know, I grew up Catholic, so I devoured this book. I, I, I just loved it. And I love the idea of these two Catholic girls in Texas, which, you know, who become Catholic anyway, of them and who are in this religious framework and and how utterly different they are um and i love i really was taken by both of them you know i didn't i couldn't say well i i loved yvette more than yvonne i was more interested in yvette's story than i was yvonne's i that didn't happen for me. They weighed equally for me in the novel. And I don't know if that's what you attended or not, um, but I found well, them equally I, I, fascinating. Had a, I had a fraternity brother at the University of Michigan, and he was from down south, and he had twin sisters who came to visit us in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where we were going to school. And one of them was called Yvonne, and the other one is called Yvette, because their mother had discovered those names in a movie magazine, but she didn't know how to pronounce them. And by the time they were grown up, they were used to them being pronounced in their original way. So I always had the, the, in mind the, uh, these two characters uh, the, the, from Texas. And you know, both of my parents are Texans, and all my relatives are, and they're all Texas Baptists. And, and so mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought it would be fun to write about that world. Yeah, I, I think um, place is so significant in this novel. It, it's, it's a factor in all your work, but in this novel that Texas is very much Texas. <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, we go to Paris and... and you write about Paris so beautifully always, but um, in this novel, it's it's a whole other. Uh, see you. See, we see now Texas through the eyes of this very um, ambitious Texas Texan girl. <laughs> so that's an entirely different take on Paris. I mean, right. So that was interesting. I read a very interesting book by Alice Kaplan which is about three women who went to Paris. Uh, Jacqueline uh, Kennedy was one, and Susan Sontag was another, and Angela Davis was the third. And, uh, you know, one went to be Polish. That was uh, Jacqueline uh, uh, Bouvier. And one of them went to discover her sexuality, and that was Sontag. And the third one went to become intellectual, and that was Angela Davis. Yes. Sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> that's okay. And 
And I guess that worked out for all three of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apparently. I mean, so place is also very, very important in um, your book because, uh, Yian, because um, that kind of experience that Lilia has growing up, I, I almost feel couldn't, have ha couldn't happen anywhere but California. Mm -hmm. It's such a sort of, we sense the history, or we learn the history of California in such an interesting way mm -hmm. in this book. And that's sort of, so can you talk a little bit about place in your, in your novel? Yes, you know, I, I think I always have a delayed reaction to places. You know, when I was in Iowa, I wrote about China and I, when I moved to California, I started to write about Midwest. <laughs> and when I was about to leave California, I realized, you know, all these California things, history, stories I love. So I started to write, this. I, I did decide this novel would be a California novel. And, but mm -hmm. California not in, I mean, this is set in the Bay Area, but the Bay Area before the Silicon Valley took over Bay Area. So it's, it's a year's year of California. And yes, I, you know, one thing I noticed when I was living on the West Coast is people always say, when you go back to the East, even to me, a foreigner, they would say, when you go back to the East. So there's that sense that the East is still back, you know, West is still the frontier. I, I, when I lived in San Francisco, people would say, how long have you been out here? Out here, that's right. So it's always that they, I, California is that frontier, isn't it? Yeah, really, yeah. Yeah, so I I, I just want to, I, I did read a lot of letters, again, diaries about California. You know, the, mm -hmm. especially the gold rush history. I, you know, I was talking mm -hmm. to my students about, there were so many interesting things. What, what my mind retained, of course, to me was, usable in a novel. For instance, this woman coming from Boston, you know, with her husband, her husband was a physician, a prospector. So they were prospecting, but he was also trading the patients in the gold mine. And she was writing these letters back to the, back to the East, to, to her mm -hmm. sister. And, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of things she wrote about. But one, one detail I really loved and I used for my novel, so it was the Independence Day in the camp, in the mining camp. And these miners were from all over the world. They had a lot of Swedish, you know, Russian, mm -hmm. Chinese, but they decided they wanted to read a lot the Declaration of Independence to celebrate mm -hmm. American independence. And so they mm -hmm. special ordered a copy of Declaration of Independence from Sacramento. But the Declaration of Independence did not arrive in time because <laughs> Yeah, the weather was not good. So, what, <laughs> so what did these miners do? They made up their own. They wrote a copy of their own Declaration of Independence. So that's the kind of the California spirit, you know. It's <laughs> it's perfect. I, 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 yeah, that's what I like about California, or at least yeah. that. Kind, yeah. What a great story that is. I wonder. Um, if you have questions that you'd like to ask one another, if there are things that you're curious about, either in the writing process or in the novels themselves that um, you haven't talked to one another about. I went to say, Ed and Ed talk, we talk every day. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> we're reading the complete stories of Elizabeth Bowen. Oh. Yeah, yeah. We, every day we read one or two stories, oh and uh, and then we talk about it. not in a deep intellectual way, but oh, did you like that passage? Yes. Did you like that one? Yeah. And yes, and we always compare. We 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 talk on Skype, so we can compare which which line we underlined, and we always underline the same passages. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna digress a little then and ask you how how and why you decided to read Elizabeth Bowen's work. I so love in her stories. I read repeatedly and regularly, and I'm just curious what brought you to that decision that we're going to read the stories together. Well, I think it was your, your idea, wasn't it, Yeah. 
I no, I think we were reading a novel together. We were reading Rebecca West's novel together. Oh, oh, the yeah. bird fought, fought down. And then you got the Bowen stories and we decided to read Bowen stories. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Oh. Yeah. But it was I mean for me it was it's such a ex great experience because there are things I miss and Ed sees them so well. <laughs> and Ed would explain to me what this word means. You know, mm -hmm. why this person from London coming to the countryside feels so awkward because he has to work. Real gentlemen don't work. Real <laughs> gentlemen <laughs> have income. So there are a lot of things, you know, I feel that in my reading I would miss and Ed would explain to me. And I also love Ed. Ed reads dialogue so well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, he would read a long, a long passage of dialogue and I would enjoy it. <laughs> I think that, that would be a wonderful segue in asking you each to read a little bit from your books, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, what? you go. No, you go. You, you're, are you going to go from the beginning? Oh, no, I thought I would uh, go into chapter five. Okay. Uh, where okay. She, she goes to Paris. Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and because uh, um, my heroine has always wanted to go to uh, Paris uh, because she's in, she wants to be involved in the world of fashion. And so she goes there for her junior year abroad directly from Texas. And she's staying with, uh, with a, a kind of ruined noble woman who lost all of her money and who has to take in boarders. For my spring semester abroad, I arrived at the big old fashioned apartment of Pauline's grandmother on the Avenue Mozart. She taught me to say Mozart, not Mozart, as we pronounce it correctly, I might add, with 17 pieces of luggage and an extra taxi. For the door on the ground floor, Pauline had given me the code, whatever that was. I saw a panel with some numbers and punched them and wedged my hat box in the heavy wood door lacquered teal blue and adorned with a heavy round brass knocker. Though I tipped them extravagantly, the drivers had just dropped, dumped my bags on the sidewalk. I moved them all into the building's big entrance hall, which had rather dirty black and white tiles and smelled of fish, cod, as I later learned, since the concierge was Portuguese and ate nothing but bacalao. She looked suspiciously out through her, her lace curtained window and disappeared. Wasn't her job to help me? The elevator was big enough for only two people. I decided to haul everything up in three trips to the fifth floor and to the entrance to Madame de Castiglione's apartment in French with two P's, apartment. When I did, when I got everything up there, I sat on my suitcase for three minutes till I stopped perspiring. Then I rang her bell. I didn't expect her to hug me exactly, but I did expect her to greet me in slow but precise French with a formality and a certain warmth. Instead, she looked at my mountain of matching Vuitton luggage, put her hands on her hips and snarled, Mais non, c'est impossible. Vous exagérez, ma chère. You have rented only a chambre de bain, a maid's room, one floor up, and you can never fit all that. She made a wide, despairing gesture and tilted back her head, lips downturned. This is not the Ritz. Oh, no, full of American clothes, no doubt. Still clucking like a broody hen, she gave me a key to my room and said, I'll see you at eight for dinner, then slammed the door. I sat down on my biggest suitcase and sobbed, but I decided to be peppy and happy, like a true tri-delt, that's her <laughs> sorority. And within three minutes, I pulled myself together, carried all my bags up in three elevator trips, found the right door, and let myself into a maid's room with a sink, no toilet, one window, a room no bigger than my closet in Dallas, the narrowest bed I'd ever seen with the thinnest mattress and just one coffee-stained blanket and a pillow 
which if you peeked under its crisp white pillowcase, you saw it had turned tobacco yellow with years of sweat, other people's sweat. There was no closet and no armoire, just three wire hangers stuck into cracks in the wall. Everything smelled of old copper wire, or was that roach spray? <laughs> I discovered the toilet behind a curved door halfway down the stairs. It had a bare bulb, nothing to sit on, just two scored ceramic tiles on the floor where you were supposed to place your feet, squat, and let fly into a stinking hole in the floor. The whole thing was no bigger than a phone booth. I couldn't see any trace of toilet paper, though some scraps of a newspaper, Le Figaro, were probably intended for mopping up, which might have been okay if you had a bidet, which I didn't. I assumed the shower was in Madame de Castiglione's apartment. No, the whole thing was impossible. I would rent a proper hotel room nearby where I could, uh, leave, <laughs> where I could stay in comfort and hang my clothes and bathe, but I would pretend to live here so I could still have my total immersion in French, if not in soapy, soapy water, and eat French food and participate in the life of impoverished aristocrats. Tomorrow, <laughs> I'd, tomorrow I'd get my hotel room while Madame was out and tip two bellboys to move my luggage and get myself some great croissant. I had researched a patisserie across the street called La Flûte Enchantée. Next door, there was supposed to be an Art Nouveau hotel with green glazed tiles and the inevitable dragonflies, something built by Hector Guimard, the man who did those wonderful old noodle metro entrances under the fanning pebble glass awnings. It was only six o'clock, so I decided to go out for a walk. I was in a very tight skirt and bright colors and high, high heels. It took me a moment to realize I had to push a button to release the front door. Everyone looked at me oddly, the men with interest and the women with disapproval. Or was I just being paranoid? Although it was January, the air was surprisingly warm and pregnant with moisture, as if it might rain at any moment, stop the moment after, and it wouldn't really matter except to my hair. I looked around for the flute enchanté and spied it, and it was open. I walked in and queued up behind four rather dowdy older women and rehearsed what I would say, but the other customers looked at me, and one even clucked, whereas a saucy teen behind the counter pretended he'd just touched something hot with his hand, hissed and shook his fingers in the air as if to cool them off. In my best French, I said, a crescent, s'il vous plaît. And the, <laughs> and the cheeky teen scrunched up his face in confusion. And the man behind me said, elle veut croissant, and tipped his hat. I smiled. The boy said, c'est trop tard, y'a plus. The man translated very loudly, not more. I smiled my thanks. When I finally chose a coffee color cream pyramid called a nun in religieuse, the clerk waved his hand impatiently as if I were a fly and then pointed to the cashier. Pay now, the nice man said. When I finally returned to my room, I devoured my creamy nun, hoping it would spoil my appetite since the food was bound to be as austere as my room. I'd made sure in the cracked mirror that my mouth showed no signs of pastry. I opened my one window and lay down on my sagging bed and stared at my ceiling, which was low and had beams buried in the plaster, rough-hewn supports that looked surprisingly primitive in prissy old Paris. The bells were ringing several neighborhood churches, and the breeze had turned cold. It was January 20th. When I went down to dinner after taking my maid's bath at the sink, washing under my arms and my neck, my hiney and my coos, and applying fresh makeup and lots of perfume, Madame de Castillon greeted me at the door, invited me into the shabby salon, indicated where I should sit at the couch, sit on the couch, introduced me to her other boarder, Justine Goldwasser, a name she pronounced with an obvious emphasis 
on the last name, as if to indicate I must avoid saying anything anti-Semitic, which he was implying might be my first impulse in polite conversation. Justine, I learned after I posed a few questions, Madame de Castiglione later told me that questions were considered rude in France, had grown up in Zurich. Her first language was Swiss German, though she assured us she was also fluent in real German. She was a song girl with dirty hair and a dirty face, dressed in an almost laughably anonymous way. She said she wanted to learn French and English, since she was obliged someday to take over the management of the family palace, which I learned must mean a luxury hotel in the Alps. Madame de Castiglione, holding herself erect on the edge of her chair, said, this is the last occasion we speak English, to welcome Mademoiselle Cravfjord. Crawford, I corrected. Yes, she repeated, Cravfjord. That is the elegant ink French pronunciation. Would you like an aperitif? Oh, don't go to any bother. Oh, I wouldn't. Elegant French people drinks an aperitif before their soupe. She stood, poured me a thimble full of sweet vermouth, and handed it to me. I smiled, but her face was blank, or rather composed, like a salad of cooked vegetables, pressed and shaped into a dome. Thank you, I said. Merci. She said nothing back, and I assumed it was inelegant to, to answer, you're welcome. Though I learned later the tacky French Canadians say, vous êtes bienvenue, a horrible Americanism. The real French might ironically mime doffing a plumed cap and mutter pas de quoi, making their compatriots smile at the antique foolishness of it all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, I will read just a couple very short episodes. This is late in the book. Lydia is annotating uh, Roland's diary. You know, Lucius is the daughter that she lost, and Gilbert is, is her husband, the first husband. So I'll just have a few episodes. The worst kind of marriage is the one that aims for happiness. Don't tell me that every marriage should have that grand aspiration. A marriage reaching for happiness is like an average Joe wanting to make a cake as tall as Mount Everest, and as colorful as a tropical island. And on top of that, to make it edible. I'm not saying it's impossible, but tell me how many people can afford that kind of happiness. We can make do with a sloppy cake as long as it doesn't topple over. Cracked? Fine. A little dense? No problem. Over sweetened? We can live with that. And they're baked, it won't kill you. <laughs> Once I watched a movie in which a woman baked a birthday cake for her husband, and then she thought it was not perfect, and she dumped it into a trash can. Oh, I laughed so hard. Someone had to shush me in the theater. The people can be stubborn. I shouldn't have laughed at the woman in the movie. Lucy wanted her life to turn out like that perfect cake. It did not, so she dumped it, along with everything else. So that's one that I'm going to read. This is one, this is about California, the uh, Lydia's comments about California. Closure. I wonder if my great-grandmother Lucille ever thought about closure. What's the point of closure when at any moment you could tumble off your mule into the valley and never see another day again. Or your best pile, or your best pal could hack you to death at night so he could run away with your $200 worth of gold. Rattlesnakes and grizzly bears and floods and snowstorms. Would they be so kind to wait until you find closure? And the man whom great grandmother Lucille took care of, both of his legs amputated just lying there waiting for death. What use would he have had for that comforting word? 
There was this young Miwok mother, 14, really still a girl, when her white husband was crushed by a fallen tree and her tribe refused to take her and her baby back. Great-grandmother Lucille made a place for them in her household. When the baby died, the young mother returned to her tribe. Did she think about closure then? Did great-grandmother Lucille, who was said to have treated the girl as her own daughter, the baby, her grandchild? Gilbert was right. I'm as hard as the hardest life. My love is as hard as I am. I came from a settler family. Like a settler, I have lived through the bumps and wounds and amputations and deaths. I don't mope. Give me an ax and a hoe, and I'll start a garden. Give me a good man, I'll build a family with him. Anything I can do, I do it with all my might. But I don't fight storms and earthquakes. There were settled people when I was born. Everyone is settled now and will be settled forever. I'm going to just a couple episodes. Thank you so much. Those readings were so wonderful. We have time for just a couple questions from the audience. So I wonder, um, oh, here's one from uh, Eve Rosenthal. She says, writing a novel can be a very transformative experience. So what did writing Must I Go and a Saint from Texas allow you to discover about yourselves? Oh, would you answer you? Oh, yes, I can do that first. So what did I discover about myself? Mm -hmm. Well, there's one thing I discovered during the writing of this novel was, you know, a character can be so stubborn that you have to fight with her every day. It's, <laughs> I, I always, you know, during the, when I was writing this novel, I always called my friends and said, Lydia is beating me. Lydia, I'm defeated <laughs> by Lydia. And mm -hmm. I think part of it is she's so elusive. She doesn't want to admit anything. So it's always, it's, it's always a struggle or like a, it's a wrestling with Lydia that I, I think, you know, throughout the writing, of course, you know, when I, I suppose when I wrestled with the character, I was wrestling with myself too. But in the end, I think, we have come to a moment of like, we probably are at peace with each other. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Ed? Uh, well, well, I think uh, discovering the uh, religious life through my character was something, uh, I mean, Yi Yun's written a very beautiful story about two Chinese girls who are brought up Ch uh, Catholic, but have to hide it from the communist government. And I thought that was a wonderful story. But in my case, uh, I read tremendous amount of devotional literature while I was writing my thing. And I tried to kind of transport myself into that mindset. And I, I think I succeeded, or at least a little bit. I, I, yes, I want to add, you know, when, when, when Ed was working on this novel, of course, we were writing these two novels together, and I would visit Ed, and Ed would just say, well, today I'm thinking about Doris Day, my saint. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would give a long talk about Doris Day, my saint. So, yes, I think I've, I've walked Ed living in this process, too. <laughs> All right. And just one more question from our viewers. Um, What's the best writing advice you ever received, writing advice that you might um, pass on to a young writer watching now? Well, I, uh, I remember once I was uh, writing a review for the Washington Post, and I was completely blocked and stuck. And the editor, who was a friend of mine, and who won the Pulitzer Prize and so on, he said, uh, the reason you're stuck is because you want to write a great review. 
But that's not the way you write. You just start to write at a certain point, then you write for a while, then you stop. And that was the best advice I ever had. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> That's so good. Yeah, yeah, anyway. yeah. I mean, when I was in when I was in grad school, my teacher Elizabeth McCracken said something. I always say that to my students. I repeat that to my students. She said, "You know, if you don't, if you are not writing now, think about in two months how miserable you will feel then, and now you're going to write." So I always say that to my students. I think about that myself. If I don't write today, tomorrow I'll be a little miserable. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, I want to, um, can you see me? I want to thank you both for doing this. I want to thank you for these wonderful, wonderful books. And I want to thank the audience um, for tuning in. And I also want to say, please buy the books, buy them right away. Don't just buy one, buy both of them and buy, how about two of each? And then you can give one to a friend after you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. want to give to a friend. Um, and in closing, I want to say, in Yi Yun Lee's acknowledgments, in the end of her novel, there was an acknowledgement to Edmund. And I want to read it because um, it was so beautiful. She says to Edmund, every minute spent with you is an antidote to life's terror, indifference, and tedium. I hope that this event here tonight with these two marvelous writers has been a little bit of that for all of you in these dark times. So thank you all for coming in, Edmund and Yi Young. Thank you so, so much. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank, Bye. You. Bye, -bye. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. We'll see you again in September. Okay, good, good. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>